Okay, so now we're going to talk about how judgments happen. The first step of this is that there is a basic assessment. And the basic assessment, we have evolved to answer questions quickly, and that's how basic assessment happens. When you see this picture, the first basic assessment is, is there a threat in the picture? And you try to figure out if there is a panther. So these are these automatic responses, kind of the fight or flight questions. Some of the questions that are associated with this is um, what is going on now? Are there any major threats? Is everything normal? Should I approach or avoid? And these are the gut level decisions that we make in the course of a second when we encounter new information. One of those that we make is this assessment of friend or foe, which is particularly interesting because we can make those decisions again within a millisecond of seeing someone's face. And we make all sorts of assumptions just based on the face as to if this person is a friend or a foe. In this study, and I'll say, I'm gonna show you some examples from studies, but there's a massive amount of work that looks at how someone's face influences how you interpret them and how you understand their value or their potential in the world. In this example, the, the experimental question was, who would you rather approach? Who would you think? Would you rather approach the person on your left or the person on your right? Okay, it's pretty obvious. And it's interesting though, the, what they did is they used a computational model to just morph components of the face to change from one to another. And they're able to influence uh, how you would act in a circumstance by just changing the features of this particular face. And the way that their model functions is that the person on the left is modeled to be an extrovert and the person on the right is modeled to be an introvert. Okay, how about this? Who is more likely to have committed a violent crime? Do you think it's the person on your left or the person on your right? Great, okay. Now, th this work is, is interesting um, because the way that they are modeling this is based on an analysis that they've done of criminals' faces. And I would argue that there's um, some ethical things to think about when you're doing that type of analysis. And I'm just gonna throw that out there. <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about it in too much detail, but it's interesting that everyone agreed that the individual on your left is less likely to commit a crime than the individual on your right. But impressions from faces are immediate and compelling, as we just demonstrated here. And that is because we've evolved, one of our greatest functions is to live in a social society. And so we are very adept at forming connections and communicating, and that revolves a lot around interpreting faces. So this is one of the types of information that we can understand the, uh, most quickly. We can understand faces um, in less time than you would imagine. In less than a tenth of a second, we can pick up information on the face. Whereas if you're shown a picture of a scene, it's gonna take you longer to interpret that same, very similar information. Okay, so this is a really interesting study that I tried to find the original stimuli for, which I wasn't able to, but maybe we, we can replicate this, um, maybe in future classes. But essentially what they did is they showed people different uh, political candidates, and they asked people to rate them based on their competence. And what they found is that that competence rating to about 70% of the time predicted who won the political race, which should be um, rather revealing in that I I'm not going to say that people only vote based on how someone looks but they are certainly influenced by how people perceive someone based on their face. Because we make all of these assumptions about someone with this 
um, visual information that has nothing to do with their ability whatsoever. Your face structure has nothing to do with your qualifications, but we make some assumptions about someone's qualities based on their face. So in this one, they asked about competence, and what they were able to unpack in subsequent research is that this rating of competence, which predicted voting behavior, was a combination of strength and trustworthiness, and sort of those two together. And they're able to manipulate both strength and trustworthiness independently. The, the individual's faces that you see here is a scale where they're showing you how they can start with someone that is less trustworthy and move towards trustworthy by morphing small components of the face. So we are in the time of primary elections. Hello everyone, I'm gonna pause right here and say that this video was originally filmed in February of 2020. We did this next part of the class before we knew the results of the primary election. And this happened to be at a time where Joe Biden did not at all seem like the front runner. He was going through lots of controversy due to his son, and I will say that no one in class thought that he would be the president <laughs> or that he really even had a shot of winning the Democratic primary. So now you can see what the students think of his picture in relationship to the other pictures. Where we are presented with information about these people, and you all might have different levels of familiarity with these individuals or different beliefs about, about their politics. I want you to ignore that completely. These are uh, Democratic primary candidates, but I want you to ignore their political party. I want you to just look at their faces. And what we're going to do is I want you to pick out the person that you think is the most competent based on strength and trustworthiness. And I wanna just write down what their scores are and we can see if this at all aligns with how the actual voting behavior of the country works out. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm gonna write on the board and I want you in the next 15 seconds to decide of all of these people, who is the most competent? Okay, for person one, raise your hand if you think he is the most competent of all of the people on the board. Just by the face, nothing about politics, strictly face. All right. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the with the primaries. Just based on faces, this class would suggest that Joe Biden would be the primary nominee. Who knows if that will be the case or not. And I, I will say that I think this effect doesn't trump something like your political step, uh, affiliation. So I don't think you're going to vote for, you're going to switch from a Democratic to Republican candidate just based on their face structure. And I think if you're an informed person who thinks deeply about politics and does research, that will influence your decision more. But the majority of the public isn't that well informed. And sometimes the only exposure they have to people are on commercials, where on commercials it's really hard to, to get substance about the contents of someone's message. You're really just gonna look at their face and how you feel about that person. And we know from research that that is highly influenced by someone's facial structure, and it's biased towards men because confidence is created from strength and trustworthiness, and on average, men are rated as more I'm having more strength than women. Okay, the next concept we'll talk about is the mental shotgun. I'm going to read a sequence of words, and I want you just to think about how quickly you recognize the words as I say them, okay? The first list is bike, kite, pipe, ripe, moon, noon. Okay. 
Now the next set of words, I want you to do the same thing. Just think about how long it takes you to process that information. Plate, freight, stroke, soap, tree, key. That's the second list of words. What do you think? Which one was faster for you to interpret as I read? The first one, the one on, on your right? Yeah. Yes, so that's what the vast majority of research finds. And it's interesting that you could kind of sense it because these differences are fairly small, but you can feel that it's a little bit more fluid, fluent to interpret information when things are spelled similarly compared to when they're not. And essentially what is happening here with this mental shotgun effect is that when we're presented with information, such as determining whether these two words rhyme or not, we think about that question and we activate lots of other questions as well. Lots of related information is happening almost instantaneously. Our mind is firing in many different ways. So not only were you thinking about if those two words rhyme, which I actually didn't even tell you to think about, but that's kind of what came up as, as, I, as I did the task. You, act, you also um, thought of how related they were in terms of the spelling. And because the version on your left has less consistency with the spelling, then it was harder for you to sort of perceive the words um, as quickly as when the, the words were spelled similarly. Any questions about that? The, the main concept here is that when you think about one question or you're presented with one type of information, you think in different ways that are associated with it automatically. And sometimes there's interference there. Okay, let's talk about this concept that was discussed in the book, which is sets and prototypes. This was cited in the book, but I found the original figure. What the, the task was from the study is they asked people, how much would you spend to save 2,000 birds, or 20,000 birds, or 200,000 birds from an oil spill? And on average, okay. on average, when there were 20,000 birds, the one on your far left, people would spend $59 to save those birds. Then, when there was 20,000 birds, people would also spend, on average, $59 to save those birds. And then, when there was 200,000 birds, people would spend $71, on average, to save those birds. So, as you know, if you read the chapter, that's confusing because you should spend significantly more to save 200,000 birds compared to 2,000 birds. And actually, what the visualization should look like would be like this, whereas if it's 2,000 birds and you're willing to spend $59, this is how much you should be willing to spend for 20,000, and this is how much you should be willing to spend for 200,000, significantly more. Essentially, if each bird was worth three cents, which is what the case would be with 2,000 birds, then you should be willing to pay three cents per bird. There's no reason to think that if there's 200,000 birds, they should be worth less money, it's all, it's all birds. And what we do in our mind, and the reason why this is function, is we don't really think about the numbers. We're not doing a calculation, we're thinking about birds. We think of a prototype in our mind of a bird that was in an oil spill. And the amount of money we're willing to pay is associated with that prototype. This sort of, uh, this, archetype in our mind of what a sad bird looks like, and we associate a value with that. They didn't do this in the particular study, but I bet if they had asked how much would you pay to save one bird, it would be about $59. Now this is the concept of prototypes, is when you're presented with large scale information, rather than doing mental calculations, you think of a example that is easy to remember, that can help you guide your judgments, like how strongly you feel about birds um, in this case. Okay, so summary of this section. For basic assessments, we have evolved to answer a basic question quickly, such as friend or foe. 
this influences political voting and most judgments we make based on face facial information. There's also the concept of a mental shotgun, which is when we process information in numerous ways quickly. And the final one is a prototype, which is when a salient mental image, when there is a salient mental image, which makes you ignore quantity. So you focus on just that salient piece of information and ignore the rest. Okay.